Today we're going to look at support vector machines, which are linear classifiers, but they work in high dimensional settings. And we're going to do this by revisiting logistic regression, and in particular seeing that logistic regression is determined by a linear kernel. So logistic regression predicts the class of an unlabeled observation using a probability function. Uh, we use training data to estimate the coefficients w sub j and then an ROC curve or similar determines what threshold we use uh, above the threshold predicted to be class 1 and below class 0. Now notice we're using bold x and in general we're going to use some basic linear algebra although you won't need any linear algebra to complete the assignments but it will be a nice notation for what we're doing. So the training data we can think of as a pattern T sub j is a vector uh, list of uh, different features and y sub j determining whether it's class 1 or class 0. N is the dimension of T sub j so it's the number of features that we use to describe a pattern. For right now we're just going to suppose that N is equal to 2. So that means we're looking at an x1 and an x2 which are coordinate variables. Each T is just a point in the plane. So the vector bold t sub j is a point and the ones correspond to points that are in class 1 and the zeros uh, those in class 0. Our goal is to separate the plane into two regions one in which all the points are predicted to be class 1 and the other in which all the points are class 0. And we can do that if we can find a separating hyperplane in higher dimensions, which is just a line in our two-dimensional example. So uh, notice that our vector x, we're going to start with the number 1, so that uh, multiplying 1 times w0 will give us the w0. And so our observations are vectors bold x and w is the coefficients. And that means we can write our probability function as uh, 1 over 1 plus e to the negative w dot x, where w dot x here is an inner product. In general, for any beta greater than 0, we can define a probability model 1 over 1 plus e to the negative beta w dot product with x. So that means we can think of the logistic function as some kind of an outer function that's operating on this dot product or inner product w dot x. Now if beta is equal to 1, that's the original logistic regression model, uh, what that means is we can think of f sub beta of u as 1 over 1 plus e the negative beta u and we'll call that the activation function and then the u is the kernel. That's the w dot x. So notice in our case the kernel is a linear mapping. It's a function of x. It maps an n-dimensional vector x to a single real number. The coefficients also form a vector but they are a vector of parameters. Now we'll be looking at other kernels in later lectures. So beta is also a parameter, but it's a parameter of the activation function, not the kernel. So f, sub, f of u is increasing and therefore invertible. So if we've got f of w dot x greater than t, then that's class 1. And that means w dot x greater than f inverse of t implies class 1. And we can actually show that f inverse of capital T is negative 1 over beta, the natural log of T inverse minus 1. The kernel is linear. If I apply the kernel to a linear combination of vectors, then I get the linear combination of the kernels. Notice what this means, that if x and z are both in class 1, 
and if alpha is between 0 and 1, then the kernel applied to the linear combination, uh, alpha x plus 1 minus alpha z, is alpha times the kernel of x plus 1 minus alpha the kernel of z. And both uh, the k of x and the k of z are bigger than f inverse of capital T, and therefore the k of the linear combination is going to be greater than f inverse of t because alpha plus 1 minus alpha is just 1. So if k and z are both in class 1, then this special linear combination, which we're going to call a convex combination, is also in class 1. Likewise, if k and f x and z are class 0, then the kernels are less than f inverse of t, and therefore the kernel of the uh, linear combination for 0 less than or equal to alpha less than or equal to 1, which again we're going to call a convex combination pretty soon, uh, the convex combination is also in class 0. In general, if x and z are in class j, then alpha x plus 1 minus alpha z is also in class j for all 0 less than or equal to alpha less than or equal to 1. And in this case, j is either 0 or 1. So we're going to give this expression, alpha x plus 1 minus alpha z, this special linear combination is going to be called a convex linear combination. And a convex combination is actually the line segment between the endpoints x and z. And we can see that if we start at x and go to z, that corresponds to changing alpha from 0 to 1. So what we've shown is a linear classifier predicts the same class for the intermediate points as it does for the endpoints. So if the endpoints are in the same class, then all the, line, all the uh, points in between are also in the same class on that line segment. And the same idea holds in n-dimensional space. So a set in n-dimensional space is convex if it contains all the convex combinations of its elements. So in other words, you draw any two points in the set, then the entire line segment between those two points is also in the set. Clearly we have a non-convex example when we have this inward dipping because choosing an x and a z on either side means the line segment leaves the region uh, and then has to return before actually reaching the z. So if class 1 and class 0 are non-intersecting convex sets, then we can find a linear classifier that can separate them. So if we have two convex sets for the different classes, then we can draw a line between them, and we can divide the plane, in this case, into class 1 and class 0 predictions. It's not actually necessary that the two classes be convex, what is necessary is that class J is contained in a convex set S of J and that among all the classes the convex sets are contained in, they don't intersect. Now we're doing this for J equals 0 or 1, but actually the same idea holds for any number of classes. So we work with two classes, but that's just for convenience. All, any of these things we've been doing would work for any number of classes. So a classifier problem is linearly separable if what we've done above applies. In other words, if we can find convex sets that don't intersect that uh, respectively contain the different classes. So let's look at the IPython notebook, see an example of this idea. So we, when we install the lecture 9, uh, it will install a set of positives and a set of negatives, uh, which is class 0 and class 1. So there are the positives, they're just numbers in the plane. And we can look at those with a scatter plot. So there are the positives. And using uh, Python, we can actually label those with a marker of 1 to show that they're in class 1.
So there you go, class one. So if we add the negatives, then we'll see something very similar to what we were looking at earlier. And that is we have two classes which can be contained in convex sets which don't intersect. So we should be able to find a line that separates these two. So we can just pick some, say 4x minus 5, that's a line. See if it works. Eh, it doesn't work. It doesn't separate. But we should be able to find something that separates. So let's suppose we change it to 3x minus 5. Well, that doesn't work either. Uh, 2x minus 3. Well, that doesn't work either. But you can clearly see there is a line that's going to work. So what we're going to do is we're going to use entropy. So remember entropy uh, was uh, the sum of the, uh, the uh, average of the information. And if we have a data set, t sub j, y sub j, then the entropy is simply y sub j as the prediction corresponding to p of x or p of t uh, and 1 minus y is the prediction uh, 1 minus the prediction for that x. So when we simplify that uh, we're looking over where y sub j equals 1 and where y sub k is equal to 0 for the two different classes and that's just this uh, double sum or this sum of uh, logarithms uh, over where y sub j is 1 and where y sub j is 0. So in general, for beta greater than 0, this is our entropy. If beta is 1, we have the original entropy. And what we want to do is we want to minimize the entropy due to the data, which will maximize the entropy for what is not explained by the data. So let's look at how we would do that. Again, we're back here in the IPython notebook. And we're going to use logistic regression to separate these two. And we're going to do that by looking at a maximum entropy model. Uh, you'll notice I've relabeled the axes, the x1 and the x2, because once you get the idea that this fully generalizes to any context. So there's my entropy. Notice in, now we're using the f sub beta, the activation with the linear kernels. So if we calculate the entropies, then notice an entropy of 36, and then we get an entropy of 72. But we want a minimum entropy. So we got this uh, function f min from scipy, and we're going to minimi minimize the entropy h. Uh, and we're just going to give it a random starting point. And when we do that, then lo and behold, we get uh, values for a minimum. Now, that allows us to create a model, a probability model, called P. And notice that if we apply P to the positives, there we get all ones. P to the negatives is all zeros. And lo and behold, we can use this to get our f inverse. And that allows us to choose our threshold. And once we've selected our threshold, uh, in this case we're just looking at a t equals 0 0.5, then we get a line that separates the data. So there's the slope, 2.1 in the intercept. Uh, negative 1.8 and now let's see what that looks like there it is uh, a line that separates so we can repeat the steps above for different values uh, and because H actually has uh, extremely large number of minima so every time we calculate we get in this case we're going to get slightly different but the same thing and you can see why there are infinitely many lines that I can draw that separate these two sets so you'll be playing with this finding several of these lines 
And notice all of this should work even if we were to increase beta. So, well, here we find another line. So again, there's infinitely many lines we can draw here. So one of our challenges going forward is finding one that's unique. So let's look at the parameter beta. As it gets bigger, the activation function actually becomes more and more like a step function. There you can see that as beta becomes large, it becomes more and more a jump from 0 up to 1. So that means that p of x is practically 1 when w dot x is greater than 0, and it's practically 0 when w dot x is less than 0. So what does that mean? Well, in reality, all we're really looking for is a w, a parameter vector, such that the w dot t sub j, the kernel, is positive if t sub j is a positive, and negative if t sub k is a negative. So if we've got a class 0 and a class 1, that means we're looking for these two regions, the w dot x greater than 0 green, the w dot x less than 0 pink, and what separates them is where w dot x is equal to 0. So as beta increases, the activation function becoming more and more step-like means that the uh, w, for which the training data entropy is a minimum, uh, is what we want to find. So the w becomes the most important thing. So what happens as beta approaches infinity? The, the w actually, uh, the successive w's for each beta actually gives us the entropy approaching zero. And you can see that by just looking at the entropy. As beta goes to infinity, the first term uh, approaches 1, the log of that 0, the second term is 0, 1 minus the 0 is 1, and the natural log is, is once again 0. So let's look at how this all works out for us. First off, I want to show you what happens when you increase beta is computationally it becomes less reliable. As a matter of fact, here we're just getting sort of nonsense, and Python told us we were getting nonsense. So let's run it again. Notice I'm generating random initial values. And for this value of the randoms and this beta, then we do get a nice line for beta equals 2. And if we keep increasing beta, uh, this will keep happening. So logistic regression as beta gets large really boils down to determining whether or not the kernel is positive or negative. So we're looking for a parameter vector that gives us this w dot t sub j greater than 0 if t sub j is positive, and w dot t sub k less than 0 if t sub k is negative. Once we have such a w, then we have our class definitions. And if we have linear separability, uh, which is what we're hoping for, then the equation of the separating hyperplane is just w dot x equal to 0. So logistic regression is implemented via an activation function applied to a kernel. Activation can be a step-like function. The kernel is linear. It's very important. Logistic regression is a linear classifier because it has a linear kernel. And this is definitely going to be useful if we have classes grouped into disjoint convex sets.